see this souls And you know it doesn't have to be this way But it takes each one of us to show them how Not tomorrow or next year, but today So be the change Be the change Be the change you want to see in the world To their eyes and see their souls and you know it doesn't have to be this way but it takes each one of us to show them how not tomorrow or next year but today so be the change be the change be the change you want to see in the world be the change To their eyes and see their souls and you know it doesn't have to be this way but it takes each one of us to show them how not tomorrow or next year but today so be the change be the change be the change you want to see Good evening and welcome to this worship service of MCC Sacred Journey. One moment, please, while I fix my PowerPoints. And there we are. Uh, I'm Reverend Joan Sanuk, the pastor, and on behalf of the whole congregation, I welcome all of you who are with us uh, virtually this evening. 
Uh, if you're on Facebook, I hope that you will uh, give us a like or a love or some kind of comment. Let us know that you're here and, and maybe let us know where you're from. Um, we're glad to be with all of you this evening. We begin, as always, recognizing that we are one with God. And if we're one with God, we must be one with one another. So let's begin by offering each other a sign of God's peace. May the peace of God be with you and share a sign of that peace safely with whomever you might be with. Our opening song is Great is Thy Faithfulness. We will sing all three verses and the lyrics will be on the screen. I invite you to rise in body, mind, or spirit as you are able and sing boldly. Great is thy faithfulness. continue our Lenten season of recovery as we focus on healing as essential to our spiritual lives. One moment, please.
the demands of following Jesus are great. He shows us that sometimes we must make extraordinary efforts to move in a new direction. As we consider the health of humanity, we cannot ignore the need to heal the very planet that sustains us. We live in increasing chaos of a beleaguered environment and the hoarding of resources. We want to be saved by something or someone else, but we discover this week that we are in the boat with God, who shows us our power to turn it around, to calm the storm. We protect the jewel that is our home, restoring something beautiful from scars of the past. Jesus, holy and holy, open, meeting the one, open, body and soul, healer God. One moment, please, while I check some tech things. If you're on Facebook, Let me know if you can hear me. If you're on Facebook, please let Sherilyn know if you can hear us. Thank you. We'll take a moment. You can hear now. All right. I don't know why that happened. Thank you for letting me know there was a problem. one moment I'll have our per opening prayer ready. Let us acknowledge now our need to restore, repair, renew our planet, this holy container of life on which we live. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the beginning you created, you created this universe with the phrase, let it be, and the waters and dry land, the sky and the creatures were formed. You set humanity among these wonders and invited us to care and honor all things. We have not successfully answered that call. Seeing the abundance as a feast that would never end, we gorged ourselves, taking more than we could replenish at a rate that could not be sustained. We are beginning to comprehend the magnitude, beginning to see that things cannot just keep going as usual and not have dire consequences.
we are frightened, which is partly why we are slow to accept it. But we now are witnesses to the forces of a world more broken than when we inherited it. Water, wind, and wave, fire, drought, and earthquake that signal it is time to pay attention and to make real change. Too often, we think there is nothing that we can do, that the change required is too great. It all feels overwhelming, and so we look away, sometimes even from the small things that could make a difference for our own community. Help That's us, us healer. healer. Show That's us our ability to chart, chart a different course. course. Forgive our inaction. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care for one another. And in this silence, we sense and acknowledge our yearning for wholeness. I invite you to imagine a warmth beginning to arise within the core of your body. It may help to keep your eyes closed. This warm orb of light is deep within you, a flame always there and ready when you need it. This warm glow begins to emerge from the recesses of your inner being and it fills you with determination and courage. It floods your whole body until your skin is glowing with it, radiating outward. You feel strong. Know this. Jesus asks us to do hard things, to make changes, knowing we are capable no matter what. We can change in order to heal this jewel planet we call home. The calm of Christ in the storm is available for you, for me, for all. Take a deep breath in to let this truth fill you and breathe out with the relief of assurance. Amen. I now invite Sherilyn to share the scriptures with us. Our modern work is from John Muir. Everybody needs beauty as well as bread. Places to play in and pray in where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul. The ancient word is from Matthew 8, 18 through 27. Now when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. A scribe then approached and said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes 
and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to, he, said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. When he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A windstorm arose on the sea, so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but Jesus was asleep. They went and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And Jesus said to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then Jesus got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, what sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Amen. Thank you. By the way, if you forgot to, if you didn't hear me invite you to light a candle, it's because I forgot to say it. So if you've got a candle and you want to light it to acknowledge we're in sacred space, now would be a good time to do it. I love that Jesus is asleep in the boat while the disciples are going nuts, worrying that they're going to drown. How can anyone be so calm at a time like that? It can only be somebody who knows that they're safe and that they have the power to make that situation safe. What does that say to us tonight? Will you pray with me, please? Holy One, we thank you for this day, for all of its blessings and all of its opportunities. And I pray that right now the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight and that together we might discover your word and your wisdom for us right here, right now. Amen. So imagine that you're in the boat with Jesus and like the disciples, you're rushing around trying to manage the situation, trying to, uh, you know, drop the sails and, you know, pack the sails and, and steer into the waves of the storm and do everything that's in your power to negotiate the storm. And then when you wake Jesus up and ask him to do something, what did you expect him to do? It doesn't sound like they expected him to be able to command the wind and the waves. But in the story, that's what Jesus did. So there are Two ways to handle a situation. We can roll with, well, there are at least two ways to handle any given situation, but here are two of them. You can roll with the changes or you can change the game. Kind of like if you're a, a Star Trek geek like I am, you remember how Jim Kirk, Captain Kirk got through the Academy there is, there is a simulation called the Kobayashi Maru that every cadet has to, has to experience. And it's programmed so that there is no way to survive. And that's part of the teaching lesson is what do you do when you can't? Everything you can do is not enough. 
And so Jim Kirk was the only person who ever passed the Kobayashi Maru scenario because he simply hacked the program the night before he was supposed to do the simulation. And he hacked the program so that there was a way for him to win. Most of us cannot change our situations quite that easily. But I want to invite us to consider tonight if we have more power than we think we have. Are we waiting for Jesus to calm the storms of our current existence that we may be able to tame by ourselves, not just waiting on a divine command? This evening, I invite us to consider our planet, beautiful planet. It's the only one we know of where life can be sustained. I know there's scientific work and exploratory work on the moon and on Mars, looking to see if there's water actually on the moon, on the planet Mars, so that human beings could live there without having to schlep our own water with us all the way from Earth. Think about how heavy water is. Think about how expensive that would be. Amen. This is the only planet we have where we can live, that we know of, that we can reach with the technology we have. And for centuries, people have been living off the land, exploiting its resources, and using them up and then scrambling to find another source of, uh, in particular, energy. Uh, a friend of mine in California, John Perlin, wrote a book called A Forest Journey, which is an amazing, amazing book. And it's deforestation as a force in history. And forgive me if I've already told this story, but it's, it's so striking the way he tells the story. He's, it basically goes like this, chapter one, in the beginning, I think it begins on Crete, the island of Crete. In ancient times, there were tons of trees. There were ample forests and people cut down the trees. They used them for fuel. They made beautiful things out of them. They made houses and palaces. They made furniture and bowls and cups. And the, this, the funniest thing happened was they cut down the trees faster than new trees could grow back. So wood became expensive, fuel became expensive. Poor people found themselves unable to get fuel for cooking. E inequalities in wealth between the wealthy and the poor grew greater and greater and greater all the time. And finally, the elites who were in charge of things, the chiefs or the kings or whoever was in charge, made war on other nations so that they could conquer them and have access to the other country's trees. And as a result, you know, that wasn't sustainable either. And their country that had had such a beautiful civilization declined. Chapter two, different country, same story. People used up the trees faster than they could grow back. They were consuming resources at a rate that was totally unsustainable. And at first everything was wonderful. And then as the resources started to run out, everything was awful. Perlin ends this story with a discussion of um, the American Revolution and trees of North America as a force in history. The British Navy wanted, commanded that some trees not be cut down because they were, they're wicked tall and they could be used as masts for the sailing ships of the British Navy. And the British Crown said, no, you're not allowed to cut those. And the Americans said, excuse me, we wanna build houses. 
We want to make things with them. What do you mean we can't cut the trees that are in our neighborhood? And that was one of the causes of the discord between the American settlers of English extraction and the government in England that led to the, the American Revolution. Some people complained to, to Perlin after the book came out. They said, well, why didn't you talk about the contemporary deforestation of the Amazon and, and other situations like that? And he said, well, I figured by the time I got to the 17th and 18th centuries, I'd made my point. You know, people have done that throughout history. We use up what we have right now, not thinking about what we'll need for later. We manage our money better than we manage our natural resources, most of us. When it comes to money, we think about what we're going to need for the days when we're no longer able to work and bring in an income. Those of us who work for a living instead of, you know, having money given to us, which is most of us, right? You know, we, we plan to have some savings so that we have something to fall back on when the stream of income changes as we get older. But as a, as a human race, we don't tend to think the same way about natural resources. So we're in an ecological crisis, we're in a climate crisis. Not only are we running out of uh, inexpensive sources of fuel, not only are we running out of uh, petroleum that's easily accessible and not and not replaceable in any in any span of a human life. Not only are we running out of it, but the way in which we've used fossil fuels has demonstrably affected the climate of the earth. Um, I am not saying this to be political. I'm saying this because I've seen the math and I'm convinced by the numbers. The temperature of the earth took a steep, a steep climb, steep climb around the time of the industrial revolution. So that was say 1750. And as people burned wood and coal and petroleum and those pollutants got into the air, the earth got warmer. We are currently, we are already in a crisis caused by global warming. Even if you're not convinced that changes in weather patterns are due to human activity, the warming of the earth is threatening people who live close to the oceans. Because the oceans are all connected, amen. Ice, icebergs melt, ice shelves melt. You can now sail from the Atlantic to the Arctic Ocean, to the Pacific, um, almost year round because of the melting of the ice at the, at the north, in the North Polar region. South Florida uh, is estimated to have a sea level rise of eight inches by 2030. So imagine that you have land in Florida and it's near the beach and it's very flat there. Imagine what a rise of eight inches in the water level would do. There was a recent article in the Orlando Center a sentinel that said 30 year mortgages are an endangered species now because 30 years from now that home could literally be on its way to being underwater. The city of Boston in its urban planning is taking into account that the sea level near Boston has risen eight inches since 1950. It's rising on an average of one inch every eight years. So the urban planners are already working on wetlands preservation because the coastal wetlands are a buffer 
between developed areas and the open sea and working on flood control. You know, the warming of the earth and the seas is connected with human activity. There's, that's, that's what the science tells us. That's what the math tells us. What keeps us from addressing it? Well, one argument that's been raised is a religious one. And, and it comes, it goes back, or it comes from Genesis 1, where God said, fill the earth and subdue it. Um, it's subdued, all right. It's subdued almost out of, almost out of livability in some areas. I don't think that God really meant for us to dominate the earth in such a way that it would eventually become unlivable. That's not, that's not part of God's plan as far as we can tell. Because the scripture, every place else, values, green spaces, plants, vineyards, forests, I don't think it was God's intention to create all this beauty only to let us trash it for a relative short-term gain. There was also some currents in, oh, I think it was the 1980s, some people who were feeling that it wasn't important to deal with the climate crisis or to deal with uh, ecology because Jesus was gonna come back you know, any minute now. And so we weren't going to be here long enough for it to matter. Whatever you believe about the end times, I think it's just as likely that we could bring about end times through our own carelessness. I think these are basically excuses and not real reasons for not addressing the climate crisis. There's fear, fear that there's nothing we can do about it. There's greed, looking at our short-term gain and not bothering to think about whether or not that gain is sustainable. There's shame, which is real, but not helpful. If we feel ashamed of the way we've behaved, we can confess it to God and be forgiven and start to do better. We, we, there's no reason to live in shame. But I think mostly it's because it feels overwhelming and yeah, it won't be easy. But there are things we can do the first project I remember doing as a Girl Scout was going out in, in the city where I lived and just walking up and down some of the roads and picking up litter. You know, we had pointy, pointy end sticks and plastic bags. These were simpler times. We didn't all wear plastic gloves or rubber gloves to protect ourselves. We picked up whatever was there, which may or may not have been a good idea. But we cleaned up litter. And partly, you know, the, the reason at the time, this was in the 60s, uh, the reason was to beautify America. Some of us are old enough to remember the first lady, Lady Bird Johnson, who made that a campaign, Flat, planted, had plow, flowers planted all over the place. What well, turned out to be a good idea for many reasons. Cleaning up trash keeps animals from getting sick on eating things that aren't good for them. And planting flowers is something that people encourage right now because it gives pollinators a food source. So there are things we can do. We can help 
generate the political and the communal, the community will for all of us to act together for our common survival. That's a little harder. Amen. That's a little harder. But, you know, we made a small step, some of us, just about two years ago, I think it was May of 2019, when we participated in a cleanup day at Jackson Park. Some of you were there. And we picked up litter all, you know, from all over the park, uh, some of it along the Oklawaha Greenway, um, some just in different areas of the park. And it was kind of a motley crew of old hippies and uh, uh, baby boomer liberals and Latino families, all of us very different, um, very different people, very different interests, very different lifestyles, but we had a common goal and that was to keep the park beautiful and to keep it a healthy place to keep it healthy. And we can do the small things that add up. Um, one of our nieces and her husband have bought an electric car. Um, that's a bit out of my price range right now. Uh, I would love to have one. Um, but there are other things we can do. You know, we can recycle. We can be thoughtful in the way we use herbicides and pesticides. And we can repurpose things. Somebody made these earrings. I'm not going to take it off. I'll just indicate, ta-da, earring, um, out of beach glass. Got tumbled and polished and smoothed out. And it's a shiny thing that I can hang from my ears. We can repurpose all kinds of things. And we can pray. We can ask for God's help. We can ask for Jesus to help us. But also remember that we have agency. And so there are things we can do to restore our planet some of which we've already done. You might remember hearing a year ago when there was a lockdown basically all around the world, how the atmosphere got cleaner, measurably cleaner, because people weren't driving around all the time. This change is gonna happen. It's gonna happen. So we, you know, we can get with it or we can stay stuck. I encourage us to think about ways we can be thoughtful and caring with the earth's resources so that future generations will have them to enjoy, to use, to prosper. We could just ask Jesus to bail us out. But I think Jesus might ask us to be part of the solution. Will you pray with me, please? Holy One, give us the courage and the imagination and the energy to be thoughtful about how we move through this earth and how we use its resources. Help us to be mindful that we share the earth with other beings, not just other people. And help us to be mindful of the things that can't be easily replaced. Give us the courage, the strength and the wisdom to help keep this planet, our home, a clean and a safe home for everyone and everything. Bless us as we, bless us as we do this. 
In Jesus' name and all your many names we pray. Amen. Let's take a moment of meditation. At this point in the service, we pause for a chance to bring our tithes and our offerings to God. I thank those of you, members and friends of MCC Sacred Journey, who are continuing to sustain our ministry by your offerings. If you are not part of this church, um, we certainly welcome your donations, but please don't feel obligated. I do want to remind uh, those of us in Hendersonville that uh, we're still collecting food and other items for Interfaith Assistance Ministries. You can see the uh, list of what's needed this month uh, in our church newsletter, which goes out every Saturday. You can also go to their website, www.im-hc.org and find out what's, the current, what's on the current list. And contact Ginny. Um, to uh, make your donations. Uh, if you're not sure how to get hold of how to get hold of Ginny, uh, give us a call at the church phone 828-693-9110. That number will also be on the very last PowerPoint slide after the service. So I invite us to be generous as God is generous. Will you pray with me, please? Holy One, I pray that you bless those who give and that you bless those who are not able to give money or things right now. I pray, pray that you would bless us all as we go through our week with a generous spirit. Help us to be mindful of your generosity to us your generosity in placing us on this beautiful planet, giving us all the things we need for life. So accept the gifts we offer now as a token of our lives, which we offer to you. Amen.
plantations grow in rubber where the grain should be high. You couldn't see the sun for all the smog in the sky. Well, can't you really fill the earth and then you subdued it? There's nothing in my book that said you gotta pollute it. So take, take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my home burning ground. Everybody say, take, take, take off your shoes. You're standing on my home With your plants and your mills You're peeling off my oceans With your waste and your spills You're fishing like there'll always be An endless supply And fighting one another For what's left to divide You didn't want advice When I first gave you dominion Maybe now it's time To take a second to get you So take, take, take off your shoes You're standing on my home ground Everybody say Scientific minds, but use them with care. You're breaking down my ozone layer up in the air. You're hyped up birds turning southern soil into stone. And some are eating meat, while some don't even get bones. I told you to be fruitful and you sure want to fly. The rich took all the land and never learned to divide. So take, take, take out your shoes. You're standing on my own. Shoes. You're standing on my holy ground Well, the earth is the Lord's And the fullness thereof From the waters beneath To the heavens above So take, take, take off your shoes You're standing on my holy ground You're standing on my holy ground You're standing Amen. We join me in an attitude of prayer. Healer of our every ill, especially of our fractured creation. We come before you now to make our petitions known. Hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. We know that already you are at work among us, showing us the way to recovery from the toxicities and grief of our time. You remind us that you are in the boat with us in the midst of difficult times. We give you thanks for this path of following you, even when you call us to cross over from one way of life to another. We pray especially for all who are impacted most by dwindling resources resources of fuel, even resources of clean water. We pray that we will continue to learn and see and know how our actions affect others, not just ourselves. We give thanks for the wake-up calls that our young people are sounding as we pray for the fortitude to move this journey forward alongside them. We give thanks for the courage of educators and activists who help us wake up to this storm and to see that we have it within our power to calm that storm, to restore the earth's wholeness. We ask for courage and encouragement to reevaluate how we as a community 
can join this effort now and into the future. We pray also tonight for our Asian American, Asian and Pacific Islander friends, neighbors, siblings. We pray that you would keep them safe. We pray that you would help them live with a spirit of peace, even in the midst of times when there's hatred directed against them for no other reason except the way they look. And God, we pray that you would move hearts and help us to help move hearts so that no one might be scapegoated for reasons that have nothing to do with anything they've done. We pray that you help us to end hatred. We pray for all those affected by COVID-19. We thank you for vaccines and pray that they might swiftly be available to all of us. We pray for migrant children. God, that they might find safe harbor. We pray for our country's leaders that you would guide them to do what's best for the, well, for the welfare of the people. And we pray for our church, for MCC Sacred Journey, that you guide us, that you sustain us. We thank you for the love that we share for each other and pray that you guide us in showing that love out to the world as well. And we pray for those intentions that we name now or those that remain within the silence of our hearts. And together let us pray as Jesus taught us using the words that are on the screen or whatever words bring you closest to the Holy One, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your dominion come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil for the dominion and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Here at MCC Sacred Journey, as in all metropolitan community churches, we celebrate an open communion. What that means among many other things is that we believe that when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, in the last meal that he shared before his death, that he meant for that meal to be shared with absolutely everybody who wanted to be part of it. And so if you've got something to eat and something to drink, that'll be what's needed for our communion in whatever way we understand it with the living Christ. I invite you to join me in singing the story of Jesus' love for us. In remembrance of me, eat this bread. In remembrance of me, drink this cup. In remembrance of me, pray for the time when Done. 
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Wisdom has baked her bread and poured her wines, and the feast is set. So let us share in the feast. Our closing song tonight is The Trees of the Field. So I invite you again to rise as you're able in body, mind, and or spirit and sing boldly The Trees of the Field. Shall go out with joy and be thy forth with peace. 
hills, the mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There will be shouts of joy, and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy, and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Will you go out with joy? Now go out with confidence that we can face the storm with Jesus in the boat, recovering our depth of love for all and our joy of living in this world. May the words of Jesus ring in your ears, follow me. And may the spirit hover and move and deliver salve to your soul and a spring in your step as you go forth with the blessing of the one who is creator in Christ and spirit and more names than we can imagine. Let us go and love and care for the world and each other. Amen. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, meeting this week is a Bible study, 11 o'clock on Thursday, right back here in the Zoom room. And um, we'll be here again for Sunday service, and I want to let people know that um, we'll have a number of services for Holy Week on Wednesday, Friday afternoon, and Friday evening. And if you are living in Hendersonville, you are cordially invited to come up to Jump Off Rock at seven o'clock in the morning, by seven o'clock in the morning, so we can start at seven. And we'll have an Easter sunrise service uh, we will have safety details and an RSVP place uh, posted on www.facebook.com forward slash MCC Sacred Journey Church. This is not the same Facebook page that you're watching us from right now, but that is where we're going to put the official details. So um, look forward to, um, I look forward to our being together safely in person to celebrate Jesus' resurrection very first thing on Easter Sunday morning. God bless you and have a great week.